Welcome to our Bible lesson this evening. We're so grateful that God gave us such a beautiful day and such beautiful surroundings here. All right, let's start our time with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us time and a place to study your word and learn. We ask that you would send the Holy Spirit. Please forgive us of our sins and wash them away, that there would be nothing at all blocking, nothing at all that would separate us from you. We're asking that you would bind Satan and his evil angels, that your hand of protection could be over us and over the recording. Father, bless and protect each one that's watching, that we could all learn from you. And we're asking this in the name of your son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen. Our memory verse is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9. Lie not one to another. Lie not, lie not, lie not one to another. Colossians 3 verse 9. All right. Spot me and make sure I don't make any mistakes. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9. You want to try it now? Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Colossians 3 verse 9. A plus. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 27 and verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold, now I am old, and I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take thee thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison, and make me savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Favorite. Esau was Isaac's favorite son. Isaac was blind, blind to God's will about the birthright and growing older. He thought he might die soon, and as a result, he thought it was time to give the birthright blessing. Usually, a feast was made. Isaac decided to perform the solemn ceremony in secret because Rebekah and Jacob did not want Esau to receive the birthright. Esau was called and asked, Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field and make me some venison, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, and that my soul may bless thee before I die. Genesis chapter 27, verses 3 through 4. Okay, we have a few review questions. Why did Isaac think it was time to give the birthright? Because he was getting old, he thought he might die soon, and he was having trouble seeing. Mm -hmm. Who did Isaac call? Esau. Who was against the giving of the birthright to Esau? Rebecca and Jacob. Mm -hmm. What should Isaac have done about the birthright? This is a very good question because I was looking at this and I'm thinking, Esau sold the birthright to Jacob, so why is 
Isaac going to give the birthright to Esau. He didn't recognize that as being valid. And what about this promise about the elders serving the younger? Mm -hmm. Like what was going through Isaac's mind? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it appears to me that Isaac wanted to give the birthright to Esau because he was the favorite and that he was choosing to forget how it was prophesied that the elder son would serve the younger. And sometimes we make the same mistakes. We make the same mistake. We, we may know what God's will is, but we have our own plan. And what was the result of... I'm not sure we actually got to the full result. I think we'll mm -hmm. get to that next mm -hmm. lesson. Mm -hmm. But there's just so many problems with this. Like he's doing this behind Rebecca's back. Mm -hmm. He's doing it in private when it's supposed to be in public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it was supposed to be a great celebration and a family event or public event and obviously since Rebecca and Jacob would not be in favor of it then they did it in secret. This makes me think about people also getting married and having a secret ceremony and how mm -hmm. that's not good. Mm -hmm. Yes, when you know you are under God's blessing and His direction then you're not trying to keep it a secret. Like you just want to tell people, "Oh, come, celebrate with me." Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you feel like you need to keep your your marriage a secret, probably something's wrong. Yeah. Now it's time for our nature study time. The exoskeleton protects the insect's body. The muscles are attached to the inside wall of the exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is like God's law, and the muscles are like our will, which we exercise in obedience to God's law. There are several hundreds to thousands of muscles, and they are very strong. The many muscles are like so many choices that we make to do the right. And we become stronger in our character through the right exercise of our will. Grasshoppers have about 900 muscles. Caterpillars have 2,000 to 4,000 muscles. Humans have less than 700 muscles. Some insects can lift carry or pull an object 20 times heavier than themselves. Can you imagine? Wow! <laughs> the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Strength to do God's will is more important than being strong to lift an object. Truthfulness is a good, strong character trait. As you work together as a family, be sure your actions are not telling a lie. For example, if a father asks his son or his daughter to clean up a mess and the child smiles, making the father think that he or she did the job when they did not. That's not good. Let's be truthful. Our words and actions, it is so important to be truthful. We need 
a clear conscience. A clear conscience is more important than all the money you can make. It's more important than all the positions that you could achieve. A clear conscience is more important than anything else. Can you sleep well at night? Are you at peace and rest knowing that you have nothing to hide? That what you're doing is right, is honorable? So this also makes me think of sometimes people call something a white lie, Mm -hmm. which is a lie, but they claim that it's not that bad. And then um, also... My children have not been exposed to modern TV until they started going with their father. And so one of my children has recently started doing this thing where she will lie and then she'll wink or she'll um, cross her fingers. And so it just made me think of those two things that it's not okay to lie and wink about it or to cross your fingers as if it's negating the lie and it's not okay to do white lies either. And so that's a habit that I'm working on trying to break with her, but apparently that's something that's common in the world. Yeah. Yeah. There is no such thing as a white lie. Let's be truthful. Let's be transparent. Let's go forward with a clear conscience. Esau passed the crisis in his life without knowing it. What he regarded as a matter worthy of scarcely a thought was the act which revealed the prevailing traits of his character. It showed his choice showed his true estimate of that which was sacred and which should have been sacredly cherished. He sold his birthright for a small indulgence to meet his present wants, and this determined the after course of his life. To Esau, a morsel of meat was more than the service of his master. Take heed, parents, that you do not play favorites with your children. Guard against making children the complete focus of your life to the exclusion of a close, confiding union with your spouse. Hmm. So Esau was more concerned about a tasty meal than about his birthright. Many people are making the same mistake. They're more concerned about tasty food, a well-paying job, a, a high position of authority. This present gratification in this world is more important to them than anything that eternity, that the future has to offer. What is more important? Money that can be spent, a house that can be burned up, a position that can be taken away from you. Is that more important to you than following God's will, than the future of eternity with Jesus? Ask Jesus to show you. If you have misplaced your number one goal in life, like Esau did. These stories are written for our learning, for our admonition, that we would not fall into the same trap. Also, Isaac was willing to put Esau above his wife, Rebecca, as well. Yes. And to do something secret behind her back. Yes. Yes, for those that are married, 
Don't keep secrets from each other. You're, you're one. One in purpose, one in mind. You promise to work together, to stay together, to be together, and to try to hide things like that. How can you trust? How can you be fulfilled when one is hiding from another? What's your suggestion for people that are married to an unbelieving spouse? The Bible does say that the believing spouse can have a sanctifying influence on the unbelieving spouse. So if you have an unbelieving husband or wife, pray that you will not become overcome with evil, but that you will overcome evil with good. And as long as your unbelieving spouse is not pulling you away from God and keeping you from walking on God's path, as long as they're being respectful of you, then over time, the influence that you have through the power of Jesus Christ can show your unbelieving spouse that God is real, that He does exist, that His way is perfect. If you have the peace that passes all understanding that only Jesus can give you, then your spouse can think, hmm, I want that. I want what, something about being a Christian. There's peace that they have. That even when things go wrong and even when they have disappointments and heartaches, they may fall down, but they get back up. What is it that they have? And through that time, day after day after day, preaching a sermon every day, and if necessary, using words. Being fair, being honest, being who Christ wants you to be, then you can win your unbelieving spouse over to the right way. True Charity Ralph Bell lived in an old-fashioned farmhouse. It had a roof high in the middle, sloping one side of it to the front, the other to the back. It was painted white, and here and there in summer a green vine or tall shrub was trained round a window or door. Behind the house was an apple orchard. In front and at the sides were a few large shade trees. At the right of the house, and a short distance back from it, was a big barn painted brown. From this, a long lane with trees on each side of it led down to the road. Down this lane had passed many a huge load of hay to be sold at the village seven miles away. And many a time Ralph used to ride on the hay when his father went to sell it. At about the middle of the lane there was a gate that led to the meadows where the cows grazed. And many a time Ralph, even when a very small boy, was seen driving them up the lane to be milked and driving them back again. This farm was Ralph's native land. And when he was eleven years old, he had never been farther from it than the village just named. Yet he was a contented and happy child. Why should he not be? For he had a well-ordered and cheerful home. His parents were plain people, but not coarse. They were refined. A dress may have a few frills and yet be made of fine stuff. So Mr. and Mrs. Bell, though they had no elegant accomplishments and no costly adornments, were made of fine stuff. 
They were gentle and considerate toward each other and to their only child, Ralph. They were polite at heart. If they had lived at the North Pole, they would have been as polite as they would have been had they gone to board at the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York. Their greatest ambition was to have their son grow up to be good and wise and to be a true gentleman. One autumn, late in November, when the loft in the barn was piled full of fodder for the animals and the cellar of the house was well stored with vegetables and apples and there was little more farm work to be done, Mr. Bell proposed to his wife a new plan. It was dinner time when they with Ralph were sitting at the table in the clean, cheery kitchen. The father said as he broke open a smoking hot baked potato. Mama, I've been thinking that I will go to my old home in Connecticut to visit my dear father and mother once more and attend to some business that needs my care. You have worked hard all the season and a rest and visit would do you good, answered Mrs. Bell. Ralph and I will stay here and take good care while you are gone. I wish I could take you both with me. I can't bear to leave you behind. Oh, do take us all, Papa, said Ralph. Who would take care of the folks that live in the stable and of all your pets, the hens and the ducks? Besides, times are so hard that Papa can't afford money to take us on a journey this year, said the mother. There is something I would like to do while I am east, Mama, but as it is a matter which so much concerns you, you shall have the veto power if you do not like my plan. It is that I go to New York and bring home with me a boy from the Children's Aid Society. I think that working under my eye he could be a great help to me. He would make more care for you, but you could train him to do a great deal for you about the house. Oh, what a jolly plan, Papa, exclaimed Ralph. He can help me do my work too and play with me when we get through with it. I had no doubt that you would vote for the plan, Ralph. So will I, said Mother. It will be a good one for us all if it works well, so far as help is concerned. Besides, it will give us a way in which to do some good. I have often thought when reading of the Children's Aid Society that I would like one of its waifs to bring up in our home. We should consider him our missionary ground. A few weeks after this tea table talk, Farmer Bell started for Connecticut. When through with his visit and his business, he went to New York and selected from the many boys anxious to go west, one to take home with him. He was 13 years old, two years older than Ralph, strong and healthy, with an intelligent but very sober face. He was an orphan and had but a few days before run for refuge to the society from a miserable home. Jack Burns, for that was the lad's name, had never been far out of New York, and the journey from thence to Wisconsin was to him the most wonderful journey ever known. The cities the villages, the fields, the forests, the hills made one long enchanting panorama for the boy. His surprises and delights gave much pleasure and amusement to Mr. Bell. At the end of this journey was the farmhouse that had been described. The ground was clad in light spread of snow. Grasses and leaves were seen peeping through it, looking chilly and dreary as if they were wishing that another spread would be sent thick enough to cover them up warm, heads and all. But inside the house, how comfortable and cheerful everything was. A neat table was spread with a bright light on it. 
Mrs. Bell showed Jack into a cozy little bedroom, which, as she told him, was his own. When the idea had fairly reached his brain that he was to have that room all by himself, his eyes opened as big and bright as two new silver half dollars. And he said, That's the strangest thing that ever happened to me yet, to have a whole room to myself. And it's warm, ma'am, and it's almost Christmas, said he, throwing his arms affectionately round the stovepipe that came up from the kitchen stove below. Yes, Jack, our sleeping rooms all upstairs are comfortable through the whole winter, tempered by a big coal stove in the hall. We have no ice in our bowls and pitchers, and a house plant isn't afraid of freezing in any room. Our hall stove is the only thing in the house that we are proud of. We wouldn't exchange it for the softest carpet or the finest furniture in all of New York. Wonderful indeed was all this comfort to a boy who had so lately lived in a wretched tenement house in a narrow city street. Soon he spied in his new little room a rose in bloom in a jar on a table near the window. That was one of the ways by which Mrs. Bell began at once to cultivate her missionary ground. After a day or two, when Jack was rested from his journey and had begun to feel at home, some regular work was given him to do. Time was laid out, too, for lessons, for reading and for play. Winter is the season when farmers do not work all day. Soon a great storm came, and Jack was delighted to see snow come where there was plenty of room for it to stay, and where it would not have to be carted away, as in New York. Jack had been two weeks in his western home. One afternoon, he and Ralph were playing out of doors. Mrs. Bell sat at her machine, making some warm shirts for the newcomer. Suddenly, Ralph burst into the house, saying excitedly, Mother, Jack tells awful, awful lies, and I'm so sorry he's come to live here. The burr of the machine was quickly stopped, and Mrs. Bell said softly, Come here and tell me what has happened. Mama, I made a splendid snowman yesterday. A little while ago, I saw Jack working at it and spoiling it. I kept still and watched him. Afterwards, to see what he would say, I asked him who had meddled with my snowman. He said, I don't know anything about it. Yesterday, I saw him playing with my marbles in the barn. I waited a while and then asked him if he knew where my marbles were. He said, no, I haven't seen them. He had told some more such lies, but I didn't like to tell you and father, for I knew it would make you feel so bad. I am grieved indeed, my son. Have you told Jack that you knew of his telling lies? Yes, mother, I told him just now that I couldn't bear to play with a liar and I wished that he hadn't come to live here. What did he say, Ralph? He didn't say a word, but ran right up in the hayloft. Is he there now? Yes, I crept up the stairs before I came to the house, and he was laying flat with his face in the hay, crying. I heard him say to himself, Ralph will tell and I shall get a dreadful whipping. Poor child, said Mrs. Bell, tenderly with tears of pity in her eyes. Mother, you and father have always brought me up to hate lying. And how can I help it? I don't want you to help it, my child. I want you to hate lying with all your heart. But do not hate the liar. To do that is not to be like Christ. 
But mama, aren't you sorry now that Jack has come to live with us? No, I am more glad than before, for I see how he needs us to help him to learn to be truthful. And do you really believe, Mama, that he can learn to be truthful? Ralph, you have been brought up all your life to speak the truth. What might you have been if you had been brought up to tell lies? Maybe I might have been a liar, but it does not seem if I would. You don't know, Ralph. Your life has no doubt been entirely different from Jack's. I have little doubt that he has, in various ways, been trained to tell lies. We will find out what his circumstances have been. Go to the barn and tell Jack that your mother wants him to come in the house and get warm. If he seems afraid to come, tell him that he will not be hurt by me or your papa. I can speak for papa, you know. Ralph ran to the barn and, standing at the foot of the stairs, called cheerily, Jack, come down. Mother says come in the house and get warm. For a minute or two there was no sound. Presently Jack came to the head of the stairs and said gloomily, I suppose you've told, and I'm afraid. Jack, my mother says no one shall hurt you. But, Ralph, how does she know about your father since he has gone to the village? My mother always speaks the truth, and when she promises for Papa, he always keeps her word. That's very queer, Ralph. I never heard of such a thing in New York. Never mind. You aren't in New York. You're out west. And you live with folks that don't pound children to make them good. My father doesn't thrash his horses, let alone his boys. Come on, Jack, and don't be afraid. Jack, thus assured of his safety, came down the stairs and walked up through the path in the snow, his hands in his pockets, and his cap drawn down low over his face. Ralph led the way, whistling to cheer the boy behind him. They entered the house and hung up their caps, according to the rule. When Mrs. Bell saw the tear-stained face and the dusty clothes, she said kindly, Jack, go up to your room, wash your face and hands, and brush your hair and clothes. The boy obeyed. It was one of the wonders of his new room, that washstand in his room, with its white bowl and pitcher and soap, its hairbrush and comb, toothbrush and clothes broom, the rack beside it furnished all with two towels, a soft white one for the face, and a large brown one for bathing. It was required that all these things should be used. Mrs. Bell was right in thinking that apparatus very necessary to the cultivation of her missionary ground. Jack lingered in his room. After a while, he came downstairs and seated himself near the stove. Presently, Mrs. Bell said, I am doing basting work now, and that doesn't make any noise, so we can talk. Jack, we can hear you tell us about your life in New York. Mr. Bell learned little more from the society than this, that you are an orphan and have fared sadly in the world. This was very gently spoken by Mrs. Bell. She continued, Do you remember your parents, my boy? No, ma'am. No more than if I never had had any. It's just the same almost as if I never had had any. Only I keep always thinking about them and wondering how they look. After they were dead, I was taken by my aunt to live with her. When I was old enough, she used to tell me that my father and mother were good and that they loved me. I am glad of that, Jack, said Mrs. Bell. I hope you will be good too and that you will know your parents in another world and live with them forever. As the loving mother spoke these words, her eyes were full of tears. Jack looked at her with astonishment. Why do you look so surprised? asked Mrs. Bell. Because, ma'am, I never saw anybody cry for me before. Did you not live long with your kind aunt? 
No, ma'am, she died when I was a little fellow. It was all the good time I ever had when I lived with her. After she was dead, I kept on staying with my uncle. He was a rough man and used to drink hard. He got another wife, and she was very bad to me. Then my uncle got to be a great deal worse. All the time, I was afraid of them both. We got poorer every day. I was sent out to sell nuts, candy, and sometimes to beg. If I didn't get much money or much to eat, I was afraid to go home, for I used to get dreadful whippings very often when I brought home only a little. Sometimes I made up a lie and told that I had got a good deal and that big boys had set on me and robbed me. Sometimes when I got a good deal of money, I carried part of it to my uncle. The rest I hid to keep for the next day when I might not get as much. Did you ever have any time to play? asked Ralph. Hardly ever. I was scolded or whipped if I was caught playing with boys in the street. Didn't you know, Jack, that it is wrong to tell lies? asked Mrs. Bell. Yes, ma'am, I knew it was, but I didn't think much about that. The most I thought of was that I was poor, and all the time so afraid. Why didn't you run away? asked Ralph. I did run away once, but my uncle found me and whipped me awfully and half starved me. I didn't dare try again. At last my uncle got sick and died. Then I said to myself, I won't stay here any more and be this woman's slave any more. She never w went much about the city, and I thought she'd never find me, so I ran away to the Children's Aid Society. How had you heard of that? questioned Mrs. Bell. I often used to hear the newsboys and the boot blacks talk about all the good things it did and how many boys went out west. How I wished I could go out there. And you have had your wish. Here you are in the west, said Ralph. Yes, I am, and in the best home in the world. Jack, my poor boy, said Mrs. Bell gently, your story has pained my heart. But now you need not be afraid any more. Do you mean to keep on telling lies? Oh, ma'am, I'd like to stop if I can. If you can, why do you say that? Seems I'm like Ralph's sled. When it starts to go downhill, you can't stop it. I've been going downhill so long. Suppose I should say to you, Jack, if you will in one year stop telling untruths, I will at the end of the year give you a farm for your own and one thousand dollars. Could you stop? A half puzzled, half amused expression came over Jack's face. That's very strange, Mrs. Bell, said he. How could you? Listen while I tell you. Sometimes you may forget to watch and you may say things that are not true. Then, if you will be a brave boy and confess your wrong at once, we shall be able to depend upon you. But sometimes, perhaps, you will be a coward. At the moment you have told an untruth, you will not say that was a lie. Then, my boy, come afterward and confess it. Now you know my plan. Will you promise to follow it? I promise you with all my heart I'll try. And if I do, he said, looking up wistfully, can you all love me some? Certainly we shall, and we do love you now. What is far better? The dear Lord loves you and will help you. Now comes by measure the smallest part, but in, a, in importance by far the greatest part of this story. After all, Mrs. Bell's pity and kindness, after her true teaching, after her wise and pleasant plans, did Jack go right on being a liar? 
Or did he begin at once to pray and watch that he might be a truthful boy? After the long talk, when night had come and the boys had gone up to their rooms to go to bed, Mr. and Mrs. Bell, sitting by the fire, heard Jack beside his stovepipe above praying, Please, Lord, make my heart hate lies and love truth. It was not the only time he was heard offering that prayer. It was two or three days after that. A violent snowstorm was raging. At about dark of the short winter after he was heard in the entry, using the broom vigorously. Presently he came into the kitchen, sat down, and took off his boots. It was a rule of the house that the noisy boots should come off when all the work was done that needed them, and slippers be put on. A pleasant rule it was, particularly to Jack, who thought it something wonderful to wear and to own a pair of slippers. As he was stooping down that evening to put them on, Mr. Bell asked if he had watered the cows. After an instant's pause, he answered briskly, Yes, sir. He sat down by the stove to get warm. Presently, he covered his face with his hands and exclaimed in a hurried, distressed tone, I told a lie. I didn't water the cows. Before anyone had time to speak, he rushed into the entry, put on his boots, and dashed through the snow to the barn. Returning to the house, he went directly upstairs to his room. Mr. Bell, understanding the boy's feelings, said, Ralph, dear, take up Jack's slippers to him. And said Mrs. Bell, Stay with him till I ring the bell for supper. The door at the foot of the stairs was open, and Jack was heard saying, I can't go downstairs tonight. I'm so ashamed. But you kept the promise you made to mother and told the truth quick, said Ralph. How was it about the cows? I forgot to water them, and when your father asked me about them, I was afraid to own it. In an instant, oh, how I wished I had. But Jack, you know you needn't be afraid. I know that, but I'm so used to being afraid, I can't stop right off. That's so, and I'm awful sorry for you, but you'll stop pretty soon. Three weeks more of the winter had gone. There was a fine skating on a pond near the farmhouse. Ralph and the two neighbor boys were going one afternoon to enjoy it, and Jack, the delighted owner of his first pair of skates, was to go with them. He was hurrying to get through with his work at the barn, being a little behind Ralph, who had finished his. There was but one small job to be done. When seeing the boys so eager to start, he said to himself, I will do this when I get home. As he ran into the house to get his skates, Mrs. Bell asked, Have you finished your work, Jack? Yes, ma'am, he said, and ran as fast as he could to join the boys. Going down the lane, soon all were skimming over the ice. They were a happy party, all save one, and he was as miserable as the others were merry. It was Jack. He felt too heavy to skate, for he carried a lie in his heart. As soon as he reached home, he hastened to do the work he had left undone. But that took nothing from the weight of the lie. He knew that his unfaithfulness had not been found out. For Mr. Bell was still at the village, to which he had gone in the morning, and Mrs. Bell never visited the barn in the winter. But his knowledge did not in the least lighten the lie. Not until in the gray of the lengthening evening twilight the poor boy knelt beside his bed and asked the pitying Lord to forgive and help him, and not until sitting together in his little room he had told all to Mrs. Bell did he feel his burden gone. This was not the last time 
that Jack forgot to watch and pray, and so entered into temptation and fell. Other proofs might be given, but we cannot tell them now. Jack kept his promise always to confess when he had been guilty of an untruth. As the weeks and months passed on, farther and farther apart, these confessions came. By the help of God and by his own efforts, more and more his word was believed, his first yea and his first nay. When the snows of another winter fell softly upon the happy home in the farmhouse, it was almost forgotten that Jack had ever told a lie. Your future lies before you like a track of whitened snow. Be careful how you tread it, for every track will show. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much that there is forgiveness for all the lies that we've told in the past. Thank you that there is strength to tell the truth as we live today and in the future. Father, we thank you that Jesus walks with us, that he cares for us, that he has an interest and a concern in us, and that as we walk with you, as we become secure in you, then we are able to have courage to tell the truth. Bless each one of us that's here, those that are watching later. Bless us that we could be a blessing. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen.